This podcast is brought to you by VinZero. VinZero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit VinZero.com to learn more about how organisations design, build and solve through digitalisation. From VinZero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to VinZero Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews and profiles. As Director of Virtual Design and Construction, VDC, for DBIA, the Design Build Institute of America, Brian Skripak is responsible for shaping how VDC brings optimal benefits to design build project delivery, while demonstrating the value of VDC to enhance the design build process and life cycle management. Brian is a digital construction innovator with nearly 20 years of leadership defining how people, processes and technology come together to transform collaborative project delivery. In addition, he leads the creation and advancement of best practices related to the integration of BIM-enabled technologies and other innovative digital tools to enhance design build team performance and project outcomes across a wide range of project types and diverse market sectors. Brian holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Architecture from the Ohio State University and is a lead accredited professional. Welcome to the program, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Brian, you've got an extensive background in the role of technology in transforming project delivery outcomes for the built environment. Share with us a little of your journey. Yeah, my background originally started uh, in college with my degree in architecture, and then I spent just about 10 years in a traditional architectural practice role, project architecture type role, working on education and healthcare projects. Um, Along that journey, I ended up being the person in the office who was maybe a little more tech savvy at using our CAD tools and modeling tools. And I always had an interest in that. Um, I'm by no means an IT uh, guru, (laughs) just somebody who wanted to kind of always strive to find a more efficient way to do things with the the applications that we had. So kind of taking a departure in my career, I went to work for a a consulting company where we were helping firms implement BIM uh, and those tools and doing training and education and, you know, education on these things. So that's really where I started to get this focus of being a kind of building technology type role. And shortly after doing that, I went back into practice at the firm I was previously at to take on a role as a BIM manager. And, you know, that was back in 2007, I took on that role. Uh, so still fairly early on uh, in the industry transition and have been in a BIM VDC management leadership role ever since. And uh, joining DBIA recently, I really found my passion in being able to figure out how we merge these new innovative technologies with project delivery to become more efficient and really streamlining the entire design construction turnover and operation process of the the facilities that we build. So you talk a lot, lot about managing teams collaboratively to fully leverage technology and solving everyday design and construction challenges. How do you actually do that? I think that was one of the big things that leads you to project delivery, um, you know, especially being, you know, passionate about more collaborative delivery models. The One of the firm, one of the job transitions that I had was going from just an architectural firm uh, to a firm that was an integrated architecture, engineering, and construction firm. And the first project that I worked on was a, a 175,000 square foot healthcare facility that was a collaborative delivery model. And you know, seeing the opportunities that we had to increase our communication and work more seamlessly because of our project delivery structure was pretty was pretty eye opening. It was a it was a different methodology. It wasn't a that's not in my contract approach that might be in your contract but it's not in my contract and it really broke down some of those traditional adversarial roles that i had seen on other projects like a design bid build project or a cm at risk project so um that that was really kind of a you know a turning point in seeing where that value really was um, because the sharing of information and increasing collaboration and communication are really at the heart of being able to take advantage of BIM as well as design build. So if you create all this great information with just your blinders on to do your work, 
but you're not thinking about how that model, that geometry or that data can really help facilitate the rest of the project team and the delivery of the work that we're all doing. Um, you're not really, you know, you're not really achieving the full value of what's there and you're, you're just kind of short sighting the entire process. So that was always big for me. So how do VDC and BIM operate collaboratively? Yeah, I think it's a, one's a foundational element and one's the implementation. I always, always like to kind of distinguish the two of those. And I, I think of BIM in more of a context of a noun. It's a building information model. It's what, what at the outset of a project we create, whether it's a building, a road, a bridge, uh, um, a water treatment facility, whatever it is, that building information model is a tangible object that holds the realization of the design intent for the project. But it's also the foundation for virtual design and construction, which is really more process-based. It's how we use that building information model to achieve the goals of the project. That's what allows us to simulate our work, do different analysis on it, do quantities, takeoffs, do our coordination, all of those type things. So the model is, is the first part. It's foundational. In virtual design and construction is how we collaborate with that model and how we use it to actually deliver the project work. So one's an object, one's a process. That's always how I like to distinguish the two. Makes it a lot easier to understand. For those listeners that may not be familiar with DBIA, what are some of the key functions of the association? So DBIA is the Design Build Institute of America. And probably the easiest way for me to summarize that is is our focus is on education and advocacy for finding a better way to build. And, you know, for, for us, that's about using a design build project delivery model, which is really predicated on um, increasing collaboration and teaming and process to have more efficient outcomes. Um, Probably an easy way to distinguish this is to look at design build as a delivery model where one entity, which is the design builder, forges a single contract with an owner to deliver both the design, the architectural and engineering design services, as well as construction services. So um, one entity is contracted with the owner. So one contract as opposed to a design bid build or a CM at risk contract where you have the owner, one contract with the design team and a separate one with the construction team. But those two don't have any any relationship inherently uh, with the owner and how they work together. So three parties, two contracts versus two parties and one contract. So you really have a streamlined opportunity to deliver the work and and everybody's really working in the same direction under that same contractual overhead. So is that what you mean by a whole team approach? Absolutely. Yeah. You have one whole team. It's not, uh, it's not fractured by those contractual silos that we see in other one. Absolutely. And DBIA have a dedicated focus on virtual design and construction. So what can you tell us about that? And what are some of the emerging technologies that are gaining attention? Yeah. So the, the, the recent focus on virtual design and construction actually started with my hiring in October. So it's been a initiative that DBIA has been focusing on and you know, realizing that this is, is cri- a critical component to moving the initiatives of design build and collaborative team structures and the whole team approach forward. Um, being able to have that design and construction technology component attached to it really makes things much easier and enables a much more efficient process to be realized. I think the evolution of technology has been interesting, right? Because we started with, we're going to create a model to be more efficient at producing our contract documents. And then we realized how much opportunity we had to visualize things. And then it quickly spread outside of the design community and the construction community. So all these efficiencies for multidisciplinary trade coordination and what they could do from, you know, better understanding how they do quantity takeoffs and cost estimating and then scheduling and everything's really expanded, even to the point where we look at turning over these models as a deliverable for our owners. Um, And it's really been an explosion of these tools. Now we see models being taken advantage of for prefab and modular construction. We're seeing robots and drones on the construction site everywhere. 
augmented reality, you know, this moving from just having goggles on to visualize something to an owner for them to understand what's going on is helping us augment construction and leveraging it for more sustainable outcomes. And it's just, it's just grown immensely uh, to be very, very inclusive of pretty much everything out there. So are you seeing a lot of offsite construction happening in the US? Yeah, I think the offsite construction's really picked up. Um, there's there's so many advantages there. There were actually a couple of projects at my previous uh, firm that I got to work on where we did do that. And being able to, you know, have that design build kind of structure and bring those construction partners in to make early decisions that benefit the entire project process is really valuable. It's something that you need to be in that delivery structure, right? You can't really do that in design, bid, build. Um, But design, build, you can have everybody there. And we saw huge benefits to being able to really draw a line in the sand of saying, this is what's going to be modularized. And in these these aspects that I was working on, we were seeing rooms being uh, fabricated in in the in middle America and shipped off to Southern California and being plopped in on the job site and rolled right in. And the advantages there where we were able to really minimize what the design team had to produce from a documentation standpoint, while the trade partner and fabrication consultant was picking up that work. Um, they were the experts, they knew how they were going to build it. So they were able to build a model that was directly shown how they were going to fabricate and install something. Because we had a, a collaborative delivery model in place, we could put those two models together. We were able to coordinate and, you know, just in time delivery was available while steel was going up and concrete was being poured. Those rooms were being done, you know, 2000 miles away and being ready to be shipped in. So as soon as it was ready, they could roll them into the job site. So we had that opportunity to increase our schedule because we had people working in two different locations on major building components. There was a cost savings due to that. Uh, There was a quality savings um, and there was a safety opportunity there, right? People were working down on the ground. They weren't up in scaffolding, installing things. So there was such a wide range of opportunities that we were able to realize doing that. Um, I hope we see more of that in the industry and would certainly be an advocate for that moving forward. And there's also a sustainability outcome because you're able to reduce the waste we typically see in construction. Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely another benefit of it. Definitely see a a huge amount of waste reduction and more accurate quantities of materials being purchased and used and and that waste being minimized, of course. So the DBIA Future Council did some work around assessing the business climate and impacts of industry trends across industry in recent times. What were some of the key findings there? Yeah, the the Futures Council was an interesting group of thought leaders that were, were put together and really looking at, you know, across the board, not even just technology focus, while that was part of it, it wasn't limited to that saying, you know, what's gonna affect project delivery in the built environment over the next 20 years? So taking that high level approach of saying, what different initiatives do we need to be aware of now so that we're, we're set to lead our membership moving forward? And I think one of the interesting things when we say our membership it's very inclusive because it's architects, engineers, uh, general contractors, construction managers, trade partners, owners, academics, suppliers. It, it's really a, a broad cross section. So we have the opportunity to have a pretty significant impact. That's where we start to look at, you know, what different behaviors and methods are out there that foster better project delivery strategies and collaboration. How do we recruit and retain high level talent? which has really been a big one. You know, how do we go beyond just the traditional college education to engage leaders that are, are far more diverse than just that, that sector of the industry and bring them into the AEC industry? Because there's a lot of excitement and innovation that's going on in our market segment. And we, we should really have a much broader approach to how we engage those individuals. And, you know, while technology was part of it, you know, it's looking at what are those long-term implications for implementing those tools. What was on the horizon? And I think that's a lot of the things that we just talked about, seeing you know, what augmented reality is doing, how do we look at different simulation aspects, laser scanning, drones, all of those things that are out there, blockchain. These are all big initiatives that the industry is starting to see 
that we have the opportunity to take advantage of and make sure that we're prepared to implement or educate and implement with the membership of our institute. So the AEC worker of the past is very different to the AEC worker of the future. Yes, I would agree with that. You start to see the idea of of data and collaboration and the blurring of lines of what traditional roles are, which is another exciting kind of aspect of, of the DBIA, right? I mean, we have the opportunity to so closely collaborate and learn from our peers and be able to take those experiences back to our other projects. So I think that that collaborative and breaking down of the, you know, I'm an architect, I just do this kind of role, or I'm a contractor, that's not my responsibility, or I'm an engineer, we really see a blurring of those things. And we have the opportunity to learn from all of those people on a regular basis, which, which makes us all better in the work that we do moving forward. Are you looking for a digitalization and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and net zero journey. Visit VinZero.com to find out more. So what do you see as the real value of BIM for the built environment? I think the, the real value is there's, there's just efficiency across the board. And I think the value is being able to clearly communicate and portray what is going to be built. And that's not something that just stops in the design phase, right? It's not just about the visualization aspect of it. Um, I think the opportunity where we see, you know, shop drawings transition from this kind of, you know, very time intensive effort to being integrated into the design process where we have a design engineer setting the criteria and we have a sheet metal fabricator really providing implementation drawings of what's going to be fabricated and installed that brings a reality to what we're going to do. And that's another part of that efficiency is streamlining the work that we all do. Um, being able to get facilities built at a much higher quality and at a reduced schedule and on budget and all of these things that we see in the past, it was, you know, you know, schedule, budget and quality pick two. You can't have all three. How do we move forward and try to get to all three of those? I think this is an opportunity that brings us closer to that realization and really is something that stretches across just our discipline and become something that's really a project life cycle approach. It's not just something we do for design. It's not just something we do for construction, but it's something that also extends into operations and brings a, a new opportunity for owners to have that same efficiency in their operations process as we would have in the design and or construction process. And then beyond BIM, there's a lot of buzz at the moment around digital twins. Where are you seeing the best example of this? Yeah, the, this idea of a digital twin and having a, a this virtual representation of a physical entity. I think a lot of people still have wide ranging definitions of what that is because it's so new. But what's exciting about it is having a digital representation of your building gives you the opportunity to, for an owner to take a different way in managing it. I use the example of the work that, that I've done with The Ohio State University. Um, they've created digital twins. They have building information models of 37 million square feet of their academic, healthcare, residence hall, athletics, laboratory, you name it, they have a building information model of it, whether it's a hospital, the football stadium, <laughs> or a dorm, <laughs> they have a building information model of it. And those opportunities starts to stretch into connecting that model for asset, increasing efficiencies on asset management and maintenance, preventative maintenance, instead of being reactive, being able to more efficiently track space for facilities management. I'm um, using it for sustainability initiatives. They have some large scale sustainability issues that they're trying to achieve. And they're using those models to help inform how they renovate or build new facilities on campus. 
Um, also being able to connect into GIS applications and understand these buildings, not only in a micro view of a specific facility or a room or entity in a room, but how they participate as a larger campus um, in their environment. So it's, it's pretty exciting to see what they've done. Um, not only have they made that transition, they've written, uh, we've worked with them to write a BIM project delivery standard, which talks about how their design and construction professionals will develop their project deliverables and what information needs to be in those turnovers. So they're readily accessible and usable by the university um, as soon as construction documents go out, right? They can start tracking space and building schedules and doing room numbering. And, you know, very immediate, very immediately, they have opportunities to take advantage of, of those models. So there's clearly an opportunity for substantial financial benefits and savings across the board from adopting both BIM and uh, digital twin modelling. What is it that makes some people reluctant to adopt that technology? Well, I think with anything, it's a, it's, it's a challenge to business as usual, right? It's a different way of doing things. So that's a big step. Uh, there, there's certainly a financial endeavor into it. It's just a disruption to your, your day-to-day activity, right? You have a process for how you do things, uh, but, you know, being able to say, stop, look at a different way, learn a different way and implement a different way takes away from that process of doing. Um, and that that's a little bit of a challenge. I'm a firm believer that we should we should all be working this way. I mean, I've seen the advantages. I've seen them on the design side, the construction side and the owner side. So obviously I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah, I don't have to I don't have to be sold on it, but there is time and, and effort. and and making that transition. And that can be difficult for people. I think one of the other things that that I always saw on the architectural side was a a, a risk avoidance type perspective into building something and sharing that information and letting it be relied upon. So there's always kind of a heavy component of contractual obligations. Well, I only need to produce a set of PDFs and I can do that the way I'm doing it. not that that's the, the right answer, but I think that's part of it as well. So risk avoidance as opposed to risk management and being able to get to a, an area where a right of reliance can be uh, provided to a model will really help move us forward. I think that's still kind of a, a tough area for people to deal with now as well. What do you see are the risk for owners, investors and those across AEC and manufacturing that are slow to uptake? these approaches? The risk is they're not going to be able to take advantage of, of the opportunities that we really just talked about. Um, I think one of the things that, that we see a lot is you're going to see owners start to request people who are savvy in these areas. Like I said, with the Ohio State University, right? If you're not able to deliver those expectations that have been set, that's in the contract at the beginning. So you have to be able to do X, Y, and Z. You have to be able to produce a building information model with this information. That'll be delivered at these stages. There's an opportunity that you could be excluded from certain opportunities. I think that's a big thing. And it's it's kind of a, you know, I don't want to call it a survival of the fittest, but, you know, this this isn't a, I'm going to wait and see if this takes on kind of kind of movement, right? It's been here for quite a while. That moment of let's see what it does is past. And your peers are doing this. Uh, Your clients are asking for it. And you need to be able to deliver on those expectations just like anything else. And concerns are often voiced about technology taking away traditional jobs across the industry. How do you see that? I, I, I I don't believe that. I think technology is an opportunity to enhance our jobs. Um, and allow us to do the work that we find interesting. Uh, nobody likes reproducing details of the same information over and over and over again. That's something that the technology takes right off our plate. Um, that, you know, this idea of saying, well, AI is going to find everything, or if we do generative design, it takes away my ability to design something. And I, I always look at this as, let the computer run and think and come up with the opportunities that might not have come across my mind in that short time frame. right? We can only produce and then study and iterate something so much, but if we have a partner and a computer that's doing it as well, how great is it to go from 10 options to 2,000 options? And we might see something that we never thought of and something that's 
while an option that the computer produces is completely not feasible, how do we take the good part of that out and say, oh, but I didn't think of that aspect. What if I chunk that out and put it in here? You know, that's an exciting opportunity for us to be more creative than we, what we might be able to be on our own, just based on time constraints and our capacity to do things. Um, if a computer can be running and looking for deficiencies or things that aren't code compliant in the background, how great is that? How can we look at, you know, life safety issues in a building? And there's so many different things that that we can start to do. Um, I know one of the things I saw at the AIA conference just recently in Chicago were, were applications that are doing laser scanning of buildings and bridges and looking for deficiencies. And the laser scan goes around and the next day you get a report where these are all the things that you need to worry about. We would never have the time or physical ability to hover around a bridge <laughs> and find everything and look for those oddities. Certainly here, I'm, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, you know, you know, bridges and, you know, the issue that we had with the collapse of a, a bridge here, you know, knowing that those deficiencies are out there, how can we use technology to help find those issues and build a safer environment for everybody in our community? So I think it's, uh, I think it's something that needs to be seen as not replacing our work, but um, enhancing the work that we do. Yeah, absolutely. Complementing the work that you do. Yes. Yep. So what do you see as next beyond BIM and where we can take this? Those ideas that we just touched on are, are really big. Um, I think there's so many new tools that are coming out with that are leveraging AI to assist in everything that we do. It's that's going to be a fascinating evolution. I I really look forward to seeing more modular and pre-construction being done. Uh, those efficiencies are certainly there. They're proven. I, I think that's going to be a big opportunity. And I think the last one is really seeing owners being able to holistically adopt this transition of saying, this is what I need to operate my buildings and how can I take advantage of all of the great work that my architects and engineers and builders are doing and how do we transition that into the work we're doing to do more preventative maintenance and long-term planning and have those buildings operate more efficiently or, or whatever it is, operate more efficiently. We know a design process might be a year or two, construction two, three or five years we're talking about operations, which is, is, you know, 30 to 50 plus years of whatever is being built. That's where the big opportunity is. Uh, so how do we move it into that sector of the life cycle? So we've talked a lot about efficiency. What about the sustainability space? What are you seeing there? Yeah, I think that's, that's another area where BIM and VDC are really helping to transform the built environment early opportunities to study building massing, building siting, you know, with a building information model, the tools that are out there that allow you to quantify those early design impacts are huge. Um, in design build, I think one of the opportunities that we're seeing is that merging of design and construction, right? If we're all there at the beginning, we can have a clear understanding of the owner's goals and how we're going to achieve those. And you really minimize a lot of the gaps that occur in the transition from the design team to the construction team. It's not a start over on understanding those sustainability goals. It's, it's really just a continuation. The other thing that, that's exciting about that, especially as it relates to BIM, is how those models can be used post-occupancy. And what owners are doing with this larger idea of the Internet of Things and sensors and being able to track how a building is performing and how it's being utilized on a day-to-day -day basis and calibrate that back against how it was intended to be used or how it was designed to be used and now start to provide the checks and balance to say, well, this is what we're achieving. This is what it was designed. How do we bring the performance back in alignment with what the intention was? And not only is that a sustainability thing, that's a, a building operations efficiency, a financial benefit for the owner, and really provides a realization of what was designed for and how it was built. So when you think future about your industry and all the things we've talked about today, and you consider emerging technologies that perhaps are still at the very early stages, what is it that excites you the most? I still think what we're seeing with uh, with AI is 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 the most compelling thing. The amount of information that can be processed just by capturing or keying in small amounts of information to 
automate a design process or provide feedback on anything that's out there is, is still just amazing to me. I think that's been, I've always been kind of on the, the more technical side in my role. So, you know, BIM and looking at how we, you know, detailed information and quantified information was always where my focus was. So seeing how other advancements in technology are now pushing into the AEC industry and we're learning from other environments, even with the idea of a digital twin, you know, that really grown out of the manufacturing segment. So for AEC to be able to take advantage of what other leading industries are doing and implement that back, that's, that's the most exciting thing for me. You know, we see that with robots, we see that with drones, and all these things are coming at us from everywhere. So being able to learn from our, our peers and, you know, understand how to implement that into the work we do, that's, that's what I see as kind of the most exciting thing. Brian, some great insight from you. Thanks for joining us today on Think Future, and we look forward to hosting you again another time. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. This podcast was brought to you by VinZero. VinZero helped the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. VinZero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our VinZero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcast at vinzero.com or from your favourite podcast platform. From Vinzero Think Future, thanks for listening.